So, so when did you when, when did you become more introverted? Was it was it more around like high school age? Like that that happens no, to a lot in, of people. In in high school, it was quite the opposite. So in high school, I was probably peak extrovert. Oh, wow. I would spend every day at lunch uh, doing comedy routines for my friends at the table. And my goal was to get somebody to spit like their drink out through their nose. That was uh, every day's goal. And yeah, it was a lot of fun. And if I'm honest, I really lacked self-awareness at that point in my life, which made doing stand-up comedy quite easy. Um, and as I got older and started developing self-awareness, and to give you an idea, I mm. went, I was at a wedding like maybe 10 years after I graduated high school. And a, a guy that I went to school with came up to me and was like, look, man, I just want to apologize for like being so mean to you in high school. And I was like, what do you mean? I was like, I don't have any memory of you ever once being. And he was like, really? He was like, oh, man, behind your back. Like I was talking about you all the time. So wow. I I was so oblivious that I didn't even know. And so right. that was creating problems in my life that I wasn't aware of. I start becoming aware of it in college, like actually starting to see myself from the outside which is very useful, but it also makes you more hesitant because you now sort of get how you come across. And so I started developing self-awareness, which was really powerful and has, has given me far more than it's taken, but it did take something away. And so my desire to be out front, to be the center of attention really evaporated um, over that like five or six year period from beginning college to getting into my early twenties. and. You know, I mean, it's a very complicated cocktail. Some of it was just getting older and my brain finally fully baking uh, and recognizing that to become a talented creator, I needed that self-awareness because if I can't yeah. understand myself, I can't hope to understand anybody else. I can't hope to write a compelling character. I can't hope to have the career that I want to have. And so very interesting. That, that becomes a, a pretty interesting loop in my life. I couldn't have predicted though how it would impact this sort of declining uh, extroversion, right? And at some point, also, you got you got sort of really overweight. I know we've seen like some of the photos of you, <laughs> right? The before and after photos, right? And so you combine all of that, right? The, the, this journey that you have to sort of like so it's interesting. I didn't know you were originally extroverted, and then it's a, as a function of the of the self awareness, uh, you just kind of like it kind of freezes you, and then it takes all of this work to almost come back to your natural extroversion and start being a lot more social and a lot more visible. So, so that's like the entire journey. It's really, really fascinating Well, you, you tie that together. But if you take the sort of, um, you know, the basic conditions that you started with and you put all of these uh, factors in some kind of, let's call it a success algorithm, and you asked it to predict the odds that this person would end up super successful, thriving, making an impact on the culture, making an impact on technology, I, I think it's safe to assume that it that the odds would be pretty low from that operation. But really, when we listen to your content, I mean, what really stands out for me is the mindset. The mindset piece comes back over and over. And something special happens at some point in your life. You develop a mindset and a series of habits that very quickly start to transform you and make you gravitate towards better and better outcomes. And you once tweeted about this way. You, you write that no matter the adversity you face, you can bury them with skill. At any time in your life, you can develop a set of skills that is so devastatingly powerful that you can turn any situation, no matter how ugly, into something beautiful. And that's really a powerful, powerful message. Do you remember when you shifted your mindset like this? Was there a moment, was there a situation where you had that realization or made that shift? So it's a uh, no, there was there have been very few moments in my life that are like a demarcation point. So there's a few things where I'm like, oh, I can tell you when I had that realization. But for the most part, it really was a seed planted in my mind when I was 16, when I read the Tao Te Ching, became obsessed with that. And really, the Tao Te Ching is is about managing your mind. Now, would Lao Tzu, the guy that wrote it, have ever described it that way? Maybe not. But ultimately, when he talks about the way, which is what the Tao Te Ching translates as, um, he's talking about the way to live your life. And so a life well lived looks like, and that's basically what the book is describing. And so as I, I had that planted in my mind when I was young, but I didn't know what to do with it or really even how to interpret it, but it primed me to like really gravitate towards 
mindset stuff. So like Tony Robbins was a huge influence on me. Yeah. And so hearing those ideas like, hey, you can get better. It's like, what do you mean I can get better? And so that translates into me obsessively learning about the brain. That changed my life. And that's the thing I'm always trying to get people to understand. You're having a biological experience. And once you understand you're having a biological experience, then you can begin to go, oh, okay, this is a game of neurochemical management. And so how do I do that? And self-belief, self-narrative, that which you repeat, these are all things that feed extraordinarily powerfully into how you feel, into whether you're managing your neurochemistry well. And so it's really been a lot of small realizations, often born of pain and suffering, right? So the great news is when you have a failure, you go through something that hurts, if you're willing to reflect on it, right? So Ray Dalio has a phrase, pain plus reflection equals progress. And so if you're willing to like, oh God, that hurt, that sucked, I did not like that, Uh, but it's gonna make me focus. And if I really look at this, I'm more likely to learn and remember it and then you can move forward. So it was, it's really been, A, it's still ongoing, and B, it's been years of like cobbling this stuff together. Mm. Um, but I'll put the two biggest landmarks as the Tao Te Ching followed by reading about the brain. And mm. that, I, I encountered the Tao Te Ching for the first time when I was 16, and then I started reading about the brain in my early 20s. Is there, a, is there a book or a thinker in particular on, on the brain science part of things that really uh, made an impact on you? I know you mentioned Tony Robbins, Ray Dalio, sort of great interpreters uh, of this stuff. And a lot of times they, they sort of build on these neurochemical insights. But in terms of the brain science, any uh, any thinker, any, any direction that you can uh, point people at um, that would be uh, yeah, productive? No doubt. So there's a guy named V.S., as in Victor... Sugar, uh, okay. V.S. <laughs> Ramachandran, um, who is just an unbelievable thinker. And he's written a bunch of books. The one that probably impacted me the most profoundly is called Phantoms in the Brain. And it talks about when the brain goes wrong and what we can learn from that. Uh, there's another guy named David Eagleman, uh, and he wrote a book called Incognito, which is like all the things that your brain is doing beneath the surface. He also wrote another book called The Brain. He had a show on PBS called The Brain. And uh, yeah, he's he's written a lot of stuff. Those two guys, probably more than anybody else, have influenced my thinking around the brain. Uh, isn't it great that we live at a time where, uh, you know, all, all of these, uh, the science, brain science is evolving so fast that we can start understanding what happens under the hood. Because I mean, forever and ever, it was always like we would write, we would interpret our experience through poetic language through whether it's religious language, pop culture, stories, whatever it is, and more and more. I, I don't know if you, you're aware, uh, you've ever encountered Stephen Kotler and his work on uh, flow states, but he, he yeah. talks a lot about how like biology scales, right? Neurobiology scales. And so it's, it's not personality driven. It's not like whether or not this sentence resonates with you or not. It's if you can learn the fundamental mechanics of, of, of neurochemistry um, that really scales. That really sort of applies to everybody, and it's, I find it really exciting that we're we're living in a time where that's more and more accessible to everybody. No doubt. Yeah, I mean, th- for however many uh, years we've had the printing press, but to think about the fact that for so long in human history, people have taken the time to write down what it took them, you know, in some cases, an entire lifetime to learn. Yeah, and they put it in a book that you can consume in a few days or a few hours, even. I mean, it's, it really is a superpower. And there's a, a pretty fascinating and I believe credible theory about what led us into the Dark Ages, which is you have the fall of the Roman Empire and then books are lost, oh, yeah. and at least in the Western world. And as books are lost, we don't have a way to pass on this knowledge. So culture no longer stacks. Yeah. Every generation has to relearn what came before them. And all you have is this oral tradition. So it becomes, you can only learn from the people that are immediately around you. Now to think that losing books plunged us into a dark age that lasted four or 500 years is crazy. And that we then shot out of it like a rocket when the West re-encountered a library. Um, And so it's like, wow. So, I mean, that, if that should be an indication for people, like right now, okay, Are there things going wrong in the world? Of course there are. But you can take an MIT course for free on YouTube. 
You can That's take why. a Stanford course for free. Like there's a guy named Robert uh, Zapolsky, and he does human behavioral courses at Stanford. They're yep. all online for free right now. You could go and listen to them. So it's like never before has information been so readily available, but you have to avail yourself of it. And, and going back to that early quote that you were talking about, there's a, a really succinct version of that. The idea that you can build skills at anything and become so devastating, nobody can stop you. Kobe Bryant used to say, booze don't block dunks. Same. Meaning if you can dunk over somebody, if you're so good that they can't stop you, then you're gonna win no matter what. No matter how badly people want you to fail, you can still win if you're able to score those points. And so, man, there's so much information available, but you have to do the hard ass work of drinking yeah. it in. But, and I know I'm getting far afield from where we started on this, but it's so important that you have to take that time to go read it, to learn it, but uh, may you learn easily what the author learned through great difficulty. Um, and to do that, all you have to do is read their book. 